record, I'm speaking on behalf of uh, Beverly Jane Pennington as well as myself. I'm here as a patient and as a representative for the Patient Safety Action Network affiliated with Consumer Union's Safe Patient Project. CU did pay for my transportation and lodging. I am also here as a representative of the independent voice of the USA Patient Network, which has been formed out of our training with the U um, National Center for Health Research. My journey with these issues began in 2006 when I had bilateral hip replacements. I had been told by my doctor that these devices were newly approved by the FDA, that they would last 20 years, maybe my lifetime. I later learned that the devices were not cleared for market until three years after implanting and removal of the devices from my body. The early failure of those first implants created a cascade of events that have resulted in six hip replacements. I have been diagnosed with metallosis and cobalt toxicity, which is responsible for the hardening of my heart walls. I live with daily pain, poor mobility, a loss of work, and a future that is compromised by the damages from the use of untested, illegally used devices. I'm speaking today from my own experience and those of other patients who I've talked with over the last 11 years, as well as the research that I have done to understand how FDA operates. First, I do appreciate the fact that FDA has formed a patient engagement advisory committee and that you're trying to seek patient perspectives. It is our thoughts, our experiences and ideas that should be the loudest, most important voice for you. On the patient continuum, there's a wide range of experience and needs, creating quite different levels of risk tolerance. Yet it seems there is not equity in terms of whose voice is being heard. It does seem that FDA is influenced by patients who report good outcomes regardless of what the data reveals. It seems as though the patients who are desperate for treatments for rare or chronic diseases are solicited for their opinions and um, perspective more often than the harmed patient. In fact, there are thousands and thousands of patients who have been harmed. In fact, right now there are probably at least 200,000 patients at risk for cobalt toxicity due to use of dissimilar metals in hip implants. And yet when we come here, we feel as though our voices are ricocheting off of empty space. As our experience and attitudes and actions we receive from the listeners convey a message that we are complainers. And our stories are referred to as anecdotes, isolated case reports, or unsubstantiated opinions. In truth, our stories of harm have the deepest and most profound lessons from which industry and FDA can learn how to better understand the minds, needs, and desires, benefits of patients that they're hoping to serve. Personally, I'm not interested in something coming fast, and most of the patients I know are not interested in speed. They're interested in safety and effectiveness, period. I didn't get hip replacements to have a greater problem. It was supposed to solve a problem and it didn't. So what are the challenges in medical device clinical trials and possible solutions? From my perspective and those that I have talked with, patients need to trust the processes enough to feel safe to participate. Patient reticence to engage is a consequence of systems which do not appear safe. Patients need to know that they're listened to and that their input and experience is received and validated. As I said, patients expect devices to have the FDA stamp of approval on them that they will be safe and effective, but it seems every other day there's a new headline talking about problems with failed medical devices. Whether reports about joint replacements, breast implants, or the cost to CMS of failed cardiac devices, it is impossible to be blind to the truth that medical devices and the processes by which they come to market are not adequate. We would recommend establishing an advisory panel that is of, by, and for patients like the one that CDER has. 
make sure those patients do not have ties to companies that make devices or nonprofit organizations that receive funding from device companies. Patients provide the single most powerful source of real world evidence. And we can tell you what is an acceptable risk tolerance, but it will vary from group to group. We can tell you what's important to us in the devices that we receive or what we would like in a trial, what works, what doesn't. Please don't assume that we only have an elementary level of education and are not capable of understanding complex studies and issues. I came to this out of need and I have learned a tremendous amount and I think I can stand my ground. There's nothing further from the truth that patients can't understand. There is an unfortunately an abundant evidence of the lack of safety and effectiveness of devices already trialed on the market. According to device events, since there are, there are 157 class three devices currently on the market, in the first seven months of this year alone, class three devices have likely contributed to the death of 3,614 patients and resulted in over 86,000 injuries. Since 2008, there has been a six-fold increase in death and injury reports submitted to the FDA, and you wonder why we don't trust it. Even the Journal of American Medical Association recently did a review of clinical trials used to support the high-risk medical modifications, and this is the conclusion of their study. Among clinical studies used to support FDA approval of high-risk medical device modifications, fewer than half were randomized, blinded, or controlled and most primary outcomes were based on surrogate endpoints. These findings, according to JAMA, suggest that the quality of studies and data evaluated should be included, should be improved, and perhaps they would be if patients were listened to earlier. Designing a clinical trial for a device has its challenges to be sure. A prospective patient may wonder, who's going to get the less than stellar hip implant? Cardiac, pa cardiac patients may wonder who's going to undergo surgery without receiving a device at all. Immoral, unethical, there are other ways. Researchers and patients alike could be concerned about the potential use of sham treatments in controlled studies. There are other possibilities which do not needlessly expose patients to the risk of surgery, which would be far preferable such as comparisons between a well-functioning device that's already on the market or a surgical procedure that doesn't require a device. If you want to encourage patient participation, full disclosure is a necessity. Patients need to be asked, listened to, and honored for their input. We should be provided with protection of investigational device exemption status. The disconnect for me in this discussion is that since there are less than 2% of medical devices proven safe and effective, the vast majority reach the market through the 510K process. And though the FDA describes 510K as ensuring safety and effectiveness, we agree with the 2011 Institute of Medicine report, which says that it is not possible to identify a device as safe and effective based on substantial equivalence. They are two different measures. Patients are not being protected when so few scientific controlled studies are conducted. And once on the market through the 510K process, the ability of FDA to respond is restricted by lack of tracking and severe lack of reporting. I could go on, but the truth is patients perceive, perceive too much risk without benefit to participate. And me, I perceive too much to even undergo another joint replacement. The burden has been shifted to industry, or from industry to patients. In closing, never in my wildest imagination did I dream that I would one day be here at a public hearing of a federal agency. 
When I scheduled my hip replacement, it was inconceivable to me that I would be harmed as a result of regulatory failure. Yet here I am, having had my life and my health turned on its head by devices which were never tested for safety and effectiveness. I'm not alone, I'm not an outlier, I am not an anecdote, I am not insignificant, and I am not mistaken. I am a patient whose voice needs to be heard, but is rarely heard at CDRH or their advisory committee meetings. It is time for the FDA and for industry to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. It's time for FDA to use the authority that it has to protect patients, not facilitate easy, quick access to market for device makers. You asked what patients think. Listen to us. Do it as the right thing for our health. Make your actions match the words. Protect the public health with truly safe and effective devices. It might even save your life someday. Thank you. Thank you very much.